Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Virtual Dickens Universe. My name is Renee Fox, and I am the co-director of the Dickens Project. And on behalf of John Jordan, our director, and Murray Baumgarten, our founding director, we are so excited to be able to welcome you to the fourth session of our virtual universe, um, which today is Harper in a transatlantic context. So just to remind everybody, these sessions are being recorded and also closed captioning is available. Um, and if you want to turn on closed captioning, you'll see an icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click on the icon, there's an option to show subtitles. So if you, if you would like that, click on show subtitle and the subtitles will appear at the bottom of your screen for the duration of the session. Um, so many of you who are here today have probably been with us for much of the week. Um, but for those of you who aren't, I wanna tell you a little bit about the Dickens Project and the Dickens Universe. So the Dickens Project is an international research consortium that's based here at Santa Cruz. This is our 40th anniversary year. So the Dickens Project has been in existence for 40 years. And each of those years until this year, we have held a conference called the Dickens Universe during the summer in Santa Cruz. And the Dickens Universe is a week long conference slash book club slash summer camp that brings together university faculty members and graduate students and high school teachers and undergrads and lovers of literature from all walks of life. Um, and we spend the week together and each year we choose one book um, or two books. Most of the time, although not all the time, one of the books is by Dickens. Everybody reads that book and we all arrive at the universe having read the book or books for the week and all of the lectures and events and universe related things are related to that book. So it's a really communal and lovely and wonderful experience um, because unlike most conferences, people have all read the same thing and all have the, the kind of same beginning point in order to begin thinking about the 19th century and thinking about the way books tell us and teach us about the, the world around us. So we're sad that we can't be doing that in person this year, but we're very, very excited that we can do it um, in this virtual space and have so many, um, so many people who don't ordinarily uh, come to Santa Cruz in the summer join us. It's really, it's really a fantastic experience. Um, so just a few nuts and bolts about how these sessions work. Um, the first thing is that we are going to communicate with each other using the Q&A function. Um, and you'll be able to see that at the bottom of your screen also. So the chat is disabled. Um, you're not gonna be able to, to raise your hand in order to ask a question. So you, if you have any questions or have any comments um, or, or wanna kind of throw out any resources that are related to what the panelists are talking about, use the Q&A fu function. We're gonna be um, monitoring that. Um, and we're gonna use the questions that are posed during the session um, for the, question and answer period during the last 15 minutes of the session. Um, I wanna call your attention to a short statement of community guidelines, um, including uh, guidelines about language and hate speech and appropriate terminology that the organizers of the conference have put together. Tara Thomas is gonna put a link to, the, to that statement of community guidelines in the chat. So um, we would appreciate it if you would click on that and, and look at that and use that as a way to, to guide your, um, your uh, way of interacting and um, asking questions during the session and after. Um, just finally, before I turn things over to our amazing panelists, I wanna offer a huge thank you to the organizers of this year's virtual universe, Ryan Fong, Jason Rudy, Trisha Lutens, and Bridget Fielder, who have just done a beautiful job putting together the sessions for this week, um, which have been just um, absolutely astounding. And also a huge thank you to Courtney Mahaney, who many of you have been in email contact with, who's been organizing every logistical detail about, um, about this week and um, all, of its, all of its technicalities. And she has just done a, a fantastic job and we owe her a huge debt of gratitude. And finally, a last thank you to the Friends of the Dickens Project, which is our fundraising and support body. And um, it is because of them that we can put on events like this. And their, um, their endless just kindness and generosity and, and love for us is really something that we could not value more. So a huge thank you to, to the Friends. And finally, I'm now going to turn things over to Jason to get our panel started.
Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Jason Rudy and I am one of the four organizers of this virtual Dickens Universe. This, is we this week has been such an absolute pleasure and I'm grateful to all the participants from whom I've learned so much. After our deep dive yesterday into Francis Harper's works, we turn now today to the larger transatlantic context in which she wrote and published. We have three distinguished speakers and I'll introduce them in the order in which they've decided to speak. Daniel Hack is professor of English at the University of Michigan, where he teaches 19th century British literature and culture, history and theory of the novel, transatlantic studies, and 19th and early 20th century African American literature and print culture. He is a co-editor of the journal Victorian Literature and Culture and the author of two books, The Material Interests of the Victorian Novel from 2005 and from 2017, Reaping Something New, African American Transformations of Victorian Literature, one chapter of which puts Francis Harper in conversation with George Eliot. His current project is on meaningful moments in literature and in life. And I believe he's left that intentionally mysterious. Carla Peterson is Professor Emerita in the Department of English at the University of Maryland, where I also have the pleasure of working. She specializes in 19th century African American literature, culture, and history, and has published numerous essays in the field. She is the author of Doers of the Word, African American Women Speakers and Writers in the North, and from 2011, Black Gotham, A Family History of African Americans in 19th Century New York. She is currently working on a new project, Urbanity and Taste, The Making of African American Modernity in Antebellum Philadelphia and New York, 1820 to 1865. I'll add that I first encountered Francis Harper's work through Dr. Peterson's book, Doers of the Word. And yesterday we heard from others who were similarly inspired by her scholarship and teaching. So it's an especial pleasure to welcome her today to this panel. Meredith McGill teaches American literature and culture at Rutgers University. Her 2003 book, American Literature and the Culture of Reprinting, features a chapter devoted to Dickens' 1842 tour of the United States and its aftermath. In 2008, she edited a collection of essays called The Traffic in Poems, 19th Century Poetry and Transla Transatlantic Exchange. And most recently, she's served as a co-director of the Black Bibliography Project, which aims to create authoritative web-based bibliographies of major African-American authors, while also reconsidering how bibliographic and cataloging practices have to change to accommodate Black print culture and its modes of production, dissemination, and use. Professor McGill is also the author of a 2012 essay entitled Francis Ellen Watkins Harper and the Circuits of Abolitionist Poetry. Our speakers today have agreed to begin with short presentations each, followed by an open conversation among the three of them. And at the very end, I'll return to moderate the Q&A. Please do use the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform to pose your questions and comments. And Professor Hack, I will now turn things over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I drew the short straw, so I will speak first. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to uh, echo Renee by thanking the organizers, uh, Ryan, Bridget, Jason, and Tricia, for putting together this, um, this panel and this amazing week of programming uh, and, and next year's Dickens Universe. Uh, as, as someone who's been working for uh, a while now to bring together Victorian and African American literature and literary studies, uh, it's been incredibly satisfying and, and exciting to see this happening. Uh, I, I'm also grateful for this opportunity to thank my two fellow panelists. Uh, my training is as a Victorianist, and when I became interested about 15 years ago in African American engagements with Victorian literature, I, I started reaching out to scholars with relevant expertise and similar interests, uh, including Meredith and Carla. Uh, uh, both of whom were uh, extremely encouraging and, uh, and helpful. Uh, so um, thank you. Uh, and uh, 
another person I reached out to, I'll just mention, I'll give a shout out as well to uh, Bridget Fielder, who uh, she gets shout outs in both categories um, as, as an organizer, but also as someone who has been uh, extremely helpful to me for a long time now in um, and a sounding board for thinking about these issues, both intellectual and, and institutional, uh, since going back to when she was a grad student. Um, so thank you. Uh, I want to, I guess what I'm doing is seconding what was said yesterday about the generosity of this scholarly community and also seconding what was said the day before about the importance of um, making uh, connections like these, of reading and listening and conversing and thinking um, outside uh, our inherited frameworks and, and our comfort zone. Uh, okay, I want to give a brief example of the kind of knowledge and insights that uh, Victorianists in particular, or people uh, interested in Victorian literature, can gain by attending to someone like Francis Harper. And the, the starting point for me uh, is that Harper herself um, was attending closely to Victorian literature and culture, uh, as were um, many other African-American writers and intellectuals and thinkers and activists of the, the 19th and early 20th centuries. <clears throat> and so we can learn a lot about Harper from studying this engagement, from studying the way she um, was located in and positioned herself in a transatlantic um, context or, or multiple transatlantic contexts, really. Um, we can also learn a lot about Victorian literature and culture from this approach. Um, it can force us and it can help us to rethink what we think we know about the cultural work that Victorian literature has done, about its ideological and formal affordances, uh, about its, its formal resources, its own resources and its generativeness. Uh, we can learn about its blind spots, of course, and, and our own. Uh, as Jason indicated, my own work on Harper has focused on her relationship, uh, not to Dickens, but to George Eliot. And, um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, what, what I discovered by reading uh, first Harper and then reading more broadly is that um, in late 19th century African-American print culture, uh, and if nowhere else, probably nowhere else for no other group of readers, George Eliot is first and foremost the author of The Spanish Gypsy, which is, um, for those of you who don't know, and, and most people don't, it's an epic poem that Eliot wrote in the middle of her career in the 1860s that was um, generally poorly received at the time, poorly reviewed by white critics in Britain and the US, and has been largely neglected by scholars ever since. But uh, it turns out that uh, it was taken up, engaged with, um, frequently cited and, and rewritten by African-American writers starting with Harper, uh, who had the, the longest, uh, most earliest, I think, and most sustained engagement with the Spanish Gypsy. And the Spanish Gypsy mattered to African-American writers um, because they saw it as speaking to their interests. They saw it as a formal and a cultural resource. And they recognized that Eliot's poem itself emerged out of a transatlantic literary tradition and, and indeed a mostly American one. Uh, th they saw the poem in a way that uh, critics hadn't really since as, as taking up the tragic mulatta story, um, right? Which is the story where a character grows up believing that they're white or say more generally part of the dominant race they learn that they are, you know, really or by virtue of their ancestry, black or part of the stigmatized race. And in the original tragic mulatta story, uh, which was um, pioneered by uh, antebellum abolitionists, uh, those characters are then enslaved, raped, killed, um, <clears throat> demonstrating the, the evils of slavery. Um, Iola Leroy is an obvious response to this tradition, um, as is uh, Harper's first novel, Mini Sacrifice, which uh, in some ways Iola Leroy 
is a very close rewriting of. I mean, it transforms it, but but it maintains a lot of its structure. And uh, in both of those novels, uh, we get a transformation of this tradition um, so that characters who learn of their ancestry um, are then have a choice of which race to identify with. Um, in both of those novels, um, as in Eliot's poem, uh, the character in this position chooses to identify with the stigmatized race and to devote themselves to its betterment, right? So it's with Harper's help that we can see that Eliot is telling a version of this story. And, and Harper helps us see this by um, alluding to Eliot's poem in both novels. Um, and, uh, and she quotes, she quotes it, she, she's very explicit about her interest in the Spanish Gypsy. Um, and she has a lecture where she discusses the poem at length. Um, the passage that she uh, alludes to specifically in Minnie's Sacrifice and Iola Leroy is a passage in Eliot's poem where um, the, uh, it, it's uh, gypsies or the oppressed people in that poem. And the, the king of the gypsies says he identifies, uh, he himself identifies with the gypsies uh, because they are abject, because they are oppressed and that the weaker the race is, the closer he clings to it. And Harper alludes to this passage in the last paragraph of Mini Sacrifice. Um, Iola Leroy herself voices a version of it, a close paraphrase of it, to, when talking of Dr. Latimer, her future husband. Um, so it's, it, it's there. The, the, there's the larger structure of the plot that is very similar. And, and then there's that moment of specific echo. Um, Harper departs in all sorts of ways from Eliot's poem and in ways that teach us things about both Harper's work and Eliot's work. And I won't get into those right now. It gets intricate. Uh, uh, read my book, please. Um, but, but I think the point is that there is much to be learned in both directions from this encounter. Um, at the end of the day, I will say, uh, and this is more or less the last thing I'll say for now, is that the, the payoff uh, of this reading these authors together um, is probably greater for Victorianists than for Harper scholars, um, or more generally for Victorianists than African Americanists. Um, because uh, as was noted earlier in the week, uh, there's an asymmetry in disciplinary training and knowledge. Um, African Americanists have read a lot more Victorian literature by and large than Victorianists have read African American literature. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's for us to move in that direction. Um, and if we do so, I think we'll, we'll learn a lot um, about um, our own field uh, and uh, reframe even our, you know, best known, most canonical authors and, and see them in a new light. I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Um, we begin out um, as the others, as, as Daniel did, by doing a shout out to the organizers um, and to thank them all for everything that they've done, as well as to Meredith and Danny. Um, and I'm really pleased to be on this panel. The first thing I have to start out doing, though, is the second is to thank my students who were so wonderful yesterday, um, giving a shout out to me, and I am giving a shout out back to them. So I'm going to take a minute to remember each one of them <laughs> um, very briefly. Um, Carita, I remember talking to you about um, uh, lynching plays and suggesting to you that you look into the lynching play, which I have not read, and you read them and ran them. Nazera, I remember telling you to read Trial and Triumph, um, look at the Black Girl heroine, and you went and ran with that. And Derek, I um, remember you're reaching out to me uh, to ask me about the Pussy Sketches, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and uh, reaching out to me by email saying, do you mind if I talk to you about this? And we've been buddies ever since. Um, it was a long time ago, however, and um, I 
I've been emeritus since 2014. Um, I have not thought since then, I've not thought about Harper in at least 10 years. Um, and right now I'm not situated in the institution of the literary field. And that's with it a certain amount of isolation. Um, people have been talking about field all week, week, all week long. And I'm not sure what I'd say what field I'm in that may be early print culture, um, African-American print culture. Um, and my interlocutors in particular have been Derek Fire, um, Ben Fagan, and all the members of the uh, Colored Convention Movement Project, uh, Gabrielle, Jim Casey, fourth and so on. Um, so that's my shout out and my explanation of where I am. Um, what I'm going to do today is return to a comment that Jennifer and Gretchen made earlier in the week about reading practices, especially about rereading. And what I'm going to do today is take the uh, series of sketches, that sketches that Harper published in the Anglo-African magazine under the uh, pseudonym or pen name of Jane Rustic. And they are fancy sketches, fancy etchings, uh, uh, different titles like that. They ran, there were five of them as far as we know, and they ran from November 1859 through March 1860. And I don't think we have any copies of the Anglo-African after that, so we don't know whether um, there were more. Um, and what I did in that early essay was to look at Harper, at the sketches, both in terms of literary and political transnationalism. It, it's there and it's very um, explicit. Um, and I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute, but I what I'm going to try and do in this talk is to talk about how the current work that I'm doing, I think might provide a rereading or a more extensive version or rethinking of of the essays. So right now I'm engaged in a project where I'm looking at African American lit literary societies in Philadelphia and New York between 1826 uh, and 1842. And what I started to do, um, well, was to look actually at reading practices. So in reading all the work about literary societies. It struck me the degree to which people had kind of a functionalist approach and that literary societies were there to do a job, which is racial uplift, racial progress. And I decided to ask the perfectly strange, bizarre question of what did they actually read? And this took me down a rabbit hole where I was looking at libraries and looking at print um, uh, lists of, of, of reading. And what I uh, discovered was this absolute fascination with the British and Scottish Enlightenment. And I'll just read um, uh, I'll just read a, um, uh, a, a quote, this is from William Whipper in 1828, and he says, the light of Scotch philosophy has dispelled the sublime fog that once enveloped the philosophy of the mind. So this was a comment made in an address in 1828. And I started to wonder, what did he really mean? And so I went back to the Scottish Enlightenment and have been centering a lot of my work um, in, that, uh, in uh, that reading. So what has come out of it is an interest that I'm having, not so much in African-American activism per se, 
as in the framework, the ethos, the orientation towards the world that in, then enabled African Americans and others to do the work of racial uplift, of racial progress. So it is more an, an ethic that I'm interested in and kind of the preconditions of activism. Um, so that's where I am going. Uh, to say very briefly about the, so I'm turning back to the Jane Rustic um, sketches. And just to say very briefly, there are a series of five uh, 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 sketches that are um, framed or are centered on the city country paradigm. So that immediately tells you uh, who the immediate um, uh, uh, influences um, or what the literary thinking that has shaped it. And it is, of course, Wordsworth, um, of the two that I focus on is Wordsworth and Mary Russell Mitford. So Wordsworth in the way in which he, um, her name is Jane Rustic. So the valorization of the um, country and the, um, uh, the idea of the rustic, the common, per the common person, the common language and so forth. And Mary Russell Mitford, the idea of the sketch of entering um, into my village. So in each of the sketches, there's a, a it, it all, um, they all unfold by virtue of conversation. And there's an emphasis then on um, both the self um, conversation about uh, character and what constitutes the self, the proper self. Um, and then domesticity, the family, and finally, in one of the in the one of the last pieces, uh, a kind of um, deviation to a consideration of the maroon community in Brazil, um, uh, Palmares and Zumbi de Palmares. So that's kind of the thing. The very briefly, what I looked at um, when I did this um, uh, essay, wrote this essay way back when, and I'm wondering now if we can how I could reread or rethink, refine my reading in terms of the Scottish Enlightenment. And I've been working on that and I have something that I simply call the three S's, which is sensibility, sociability, and sympathy. And I'll say something very briefly about that and then bring it back to um, Harper. So sensibility for somebody, a British and Englishman Shaftesbury, but also um, a writer like um, Hutchinson, is the development of the, inner, of the inner moral self. And I think that we can see the importance that that had for African-Americans at the time to say that everybody is born with an inner moral self, right? And that it is there to be cultivated. Um, and that, uh, that then uh, uh, is what, I think um, Harper ends up by calling character. And I've always said to my students, character seems to be one of the fav her favorite words in her writing. The second is sociability, which is bringing together like-minded people in conversation to discuss I uh, different kinds of ideas um, and also conviviality. And so think of the way in which Harper is so filled with conversation and the sketches are um, basically built on the structure um, of the conversation. And then you can think of the conversazione in Aiello Leroy, you can think of the friends in council, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the last one, and perhaps the, uh, what I'm most interested in here now is sympathy. And of course we can go back to Adam Smith and the Scottish um, and his ideas about sympathy, which starts with seeing. Uh, you see somebody in pain and distress or so forth, you don't identify, but you imagine what they're feeling and then you are led to feel sympath sympathy. So I think we can see the way in which all of these terms play out in, um, Jane, Rusk in Jane Rustic's fancy sketches. Um, the idea of the cultivation of the inner moral sense, which is all over um, each of the five uh, uh, sketches and the way in which um, some of the characters have been unable to develop um, character as it, as it were. The idea of the conversation, just people coming together and talking all the time and talking through issues. And finally, the notion of sympathy. 
And I think that what's so interesting with Harper is that she's really kind of revising um, Adam Smith's notion of sympathy. So it's not looking at somebody and feeling their distress or their pain, but it's more a rela relationship of mutuality and interdependence. And she has one um, uh, uh, line where she's talking actually about marriage and she's saying there's, uh, there's no marriage is possible where there is no sympathy, no congeniality of souls, no union of the heart. So what I'm thinking about or wondering is whether congeniality is not really one of the, one of the things that Harper is trying to um, display and de uh, deploy in so much of her writing that we're not, uh, sympathy is not that gesture of, um, you know, uh, looking down at the person in pain and wanting to helping them, but it's a union of like-minded um, people. So in the conversation yesterday, I was so taken with what um, my, uh, Caritha, Nerzera, and um, uh, Derek were saying um, about Harper and, um, and about Iola Leroy and other texts as well. So I'm thinking of the way in which um, there is, she has sympathy towards her characters, right? So that um, you could, dismiss Eugene Leroy as a jerk, but she doesn't. She really tries to see where they, where there might be common ground with Eugene um, Leroy. Uh, the sympathy that the characters have for one another, and I think this is part, or the congeniality, part of the conversations. We get together and we debate, we could be so far apart you know, at the start, but maybe through conversation, we can find common ground, we can find congeniality. And then, of course, the sympathy um, that she has towards her reader and the way in which Harper is always pulling in her reader um, and appealing to the reader in fancy sketches, she, in fact, says, um, you've got to read the Anglo-American magazine and go out and buy a copy. Um, so those are my preliminary remarks that I want to make, and I, you know, uh, we can come back and discuss any one of them um, after Meredith goes. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Carla and Danny. It's great, great to hear you, uh, and it's great to be here. I, I've been to Dickens University a couple of times, and I'm in deep conversation with people in African American studies. So it kind of feels like bringing some worlds together for the first time. Uh, here. I thought I'd say a few things about why I've been drawn to transatlantic perspectives um, and what that means for my thinking, what Harper's meant to me within that context. And so I'll just say that um, I've been drawn to transatlanticism because I study print culture. And although we tend to study and teach national literary traditions, once you approach 19th century, particularly 19th century uh, print culture in the U.S., you realize when you pr when you approach it not from the author text side of things, but from the production circulation of books, you realize that American culture, uh, particularly antebellum American culture, was just suffused with British texts. Uh, you may not know that it took until 1890 for the U.S. to pass an international copyright to be a sign on to an international copyright treaty. I spent spilled a lot of ink on why that was, why Americans resisted. Um, uh, uh, authors' rights, and a lot of it had to do with providing cheap uh, reading for a growing mass culture. Um, but uh, again, when you when you look at uh, American, when you look at the circulation of books in America, you can't just uh, think in terms of books written by Americans. Um, uh, and so I got really drawn into Harper, again, approaching her from a print culture perspective. She's really opened up for me new ways of thinking about how poetry thrives in early mass culture. I'm mostly working between 1820 and 1860. Of course, the text that we're going to be, we've already started talking about thinking about reading, studying is an 1890s text. Uh, so my Harper tends to be uh, the Harper up until and just after uh, the Civil War, but a lot of the things she's interested in in the 1850s and 60s, though she strikes those themes early and we'll see them again and again in Iola Leroy. But uh, Harper really opened up for me how to think about how poetry thrives in early mass culture, a culture, a literary culture that's in broadsides and newspapers and periodicals uh, that circulate in much higher numbers than books, right? So we tend to study authors and 
texts and authors and books, novels as freestanding books and poetry we read out of anthologies. Um, but if you get back into the newspapers and periodicals uh, that Harper was publishing in, in a really active way, uh, she's really become paradigmatic for me. And I'm thinking of something Ryan said early on, I think early, I, first or second uh, session in the week, what would happen if we shifted our scholarship and teaching so that African-American texts take up the epistemological frame or texts written by um, minority scholars of various kinds uh, take up the, the epistemological frame uh, and then we reorient the canon in relation to this new, uh, he's setting a pick in basketball terms, uh, right? And that's really happened for me with Harper. If you take Harper as paradigmatic of uh, antebellum poetry in the US, all of a sudden you realize that poets like Sigourney and um, Whittier uh, and Emerson uh, uh, and William Gilmore Sims, they're all publishing fanatically in newspapers. So if you take her as the model uh, and you disaggregate uh, those nice tidy anthologies of poetry, you really get a much different scene of circulation. Um, so, uh, you know, I wrote that essay that uh, Jason alluded to uh, uh, about uh, what it means to think about Harper as a, to think about her poetics, not as a, um, an anthology piece of separate isolate lyrics, but to think about so many of her poems were responses to the ongoing work of the abolitionist struggle. And they did, they did very complicated work. A poem like To Charles Sumner is responding in real time uh, to uh, the first time he, uh, Charles Sumner came back on the uh, Senate floor at, to give a speech after he'd been, after he'd recovered three years later of being caned viciously uh, for his abolitionist views. Uh, She's a very powerful poet of uh, representing black opinion to white readers uh, and modeling certain kinds of responses. There's lots of interesting talk back. Her poem, Eliza Harris, takes a character from inside of Stowe's novel and reanimates it. Um, you know, if you see her poems in the context of, uh, of newspapers uh, and also in pamphlet publications, she uh, uh, broke into the abolitionist lecture circuit in the early 1853. Uh, and in part, I think, because of her status as a poet, as a poetess, gave her license to a kind of gentility that allowed, it's, it's hard for women to speak in public in the 1850s and doubly hard for women of color. Uh, so being a poetess really helped with her cultural stature, but going around the country giving abolitionist lectures enabled her to sell pamphlet versions of her poems. They weren't bound books, they were printed off in small uh, uh, numbers, so and often with no price inside. Frances Foster really helped me see the purpose of that, right? She could sell it for a variable price to white audiences for a certain price, to black audiences to give it out free or, or to sell it for a cheaper price. There's a kind of flexibility, and this is important to think about Harper's prose as well, uh, and um, Carla has already talked about this and other people have too. She's, she's always thinking about multiple audiences. She's addressing both black audiences, white audiences, mixed audiences. She's drawing in a wider range of uh, auditors and readers into a literary universe. Uh, and I think studying her poetry can help you see that uh, in the prose. I also think, uh, as another note we struck early on about what it means to think transatlantically, most of us are trained in a single tradition. And of course, authors, American authors, African-American authors, Victorian authors are troping off of the authors in their national traditions that have come before. Um, but I think we've really artificially separated out literatures that if you, again, if you look at them from the print marketplace, you see that they jostle with each other. Um, uh, and I think we, we need to become more adept at recognizing those conversations. And uh, I think print, studying from a print culture perspective can help you see them. And I'll give one really resonant example, it kind of blew my mind. I just decided to, I've been doing some work on pamphlet publication, especially pamphlet versions of poets and poetry, and they're much more widespread than you'd think. So I started looking into the publisher, uh, Harper's first publisher in Boston, J.B. Yarrington and Son. And those of you who are African-Americanists will know right away uh, that he's the publisher of uh, Garrison's Liberator from the 1840s on, a Boston publisher of a uh, major ab abolitionist newspaper. He's a newspaper and a job printer, and he often printed pamphlets for people who couldn't afford or couldn't, had no regular access to uh, publish regular book publishing houses, uh, including lots of uh, writers of color. In fact, he's the printer or publisher of 
a lot of canonical black texts from the 19, from the 1850s, right? Uh, not only Harper's poems on miscellaneous subjects, Sojourner Truth's narrative, William Nell's Colored Patriots of the American Revolution, Josephine Brown's biography of her father, William Wells Brown, and Brown's own play, The Escape. Those are all published by J.B. Yarrington. So now we get a different canon, right? If we, if we approach it through the publisher, but even more amazing to me was to do a little research on the son in J.B. Yarrington and Sons. Uh, he had a son uh, who collaborated with him on the newspaper press for a while and then spun off his specialty as a stenographic uh, reporter, a shorthand reporter for uh, lectures and orations. Um, uh, so he's kind of this invisible presence at the, all the crucial meetings of anti-slavery activists. He's there as a kind of, uh, you know, silent figure taking down um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the extemporaneous uh, parts of people's speeches and then get, getting them into print. So he's there at the nexus between oratory and print, very important nexus for thinking about Harper uh, and her performance as a poetess and as an abolitionist lecturer. But it turns out he, so he's, he's Yarrington and Son are Harper's publishers. He's also, Yarrington, the younger Yarrington is also Ralph Waldo Emerson's favorite shorthand reporter, right? Emerson calls on him, asks for him to produce transcripts of his lectures. We think Emerson's over here, American literature, and Harper's over here in African American literature. Well, there's one step between them, uh, right? And it's Yarrington and Sons. Uh, I think it's really important to think that, you know, um, Harper and Emerson are occupying some of the same cultural sites. Uh, we need to start thinking them together as well as apart. Uh, so that kind of kind of blew my mind. And to get back to Dickens, uh, if we think about Harper's versatility as a poet, a uh, writer of short pieces like the Fancy Sketches, a novelist, um, a lecturer, important lecturer, not only in abolition, uh, but a lecturer uh, on the other side of emancipation, a um, uh, uh, crucial member of the, of the temperance union, often the only black face on the dais for women's rights organization. She's just a huge figure in, in all the sisterhood of reforms like Dickens, right? They have a lot in common. They both were masterful performers and lecturers. Uh, uh, they both took advantage of multiple formats for circulating their work. They're both incredibly adept uh, at moving uh, between and among these different formats, serialization, periodicals, um, public performance. Uh, and I think they both can think in in innovative ways generically about how to include wider readerships in uh, imaginative work. So, you know, I do think uh, even from the earlier part, from the 1840s and 50s, Dickens and Harper are an amazing pair. And if we take our lead from Harper, we might we might see Dickens not just as a novelist, but as working across all these different modalities um, if we use her to set our epistemological frame. And I've got more thoughts, but I think we should move it back to the general conversation and, um, and uh, we can bounce around a little bit um, if, if that makes some sense. So I don't know, Danny and Carla, if you wanna pick up um, pursue something. Yeah, this is Carla. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about, I'm taking just one of your small, one of your many points, um, is the whole idea of reading poetry in a newspaper and how I think that is absolutely so important. So in the work that I've been doing, I um, have been looking at the earlier poets um, um, and in particular, Sarah Fortin, who publishes a lot in The Liberator. And um, one of the things, so I'm toying, going back to the 18th century, I'm trying with trying to distinguish between sensibility and sentimentality. So British sensibility and American sentimentality. And reading some of those British poems, which are really, really long, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, like book after book after book and kind of reading what um, 18th century scholars have had to say about it and the way in which the audience is an audience of the people of leisure who have the time to sit down and read through all of that in a book format. Um, and the way in which in, uh, uh, within it, there are, it, their arguments, their didactic and their arguments, but the importance of balancing reason and passion. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that then when we get to American sentimentality, or in at least one version of the sentimental poem, is to kind of lop it off from all context, right? And see it as just, you know, these 12 lines of, of, of sentiment. And so it was really interesting for me to put Sarah Fortin um, 
look at where she published, was it, which was in the newspaper and uh, in the Liberator, and see how she is actually in conversation with other things that are going on on the page, right? Yeah. So that she might have a sentimental poem about the slave mother or, you know, the dying slave or whatever, but right next, next to it, there'll be a lengthy um, article about uh, uh, slavery, the need to abolish it, arguments about, you know, liberty, et cetera, et cetera. So if, coming back to your point about, you know, the anthology and how much we tend, how often we tend to read um, through the anthology today, but in the 19th century and for the audience, you know, people who didn't have a lot of leisure time, right, to read 10 volumes um, and who couldn't afford it, that poetry came in this form, but it's never, it's not isolated, it's in relation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, I want to come back to uh, something, Meredith, you were talking about at the end uh, about the um, epistemological framing. Um, and, um, you know, there's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been inevitable this week, since this is the Dickens universe, that, that the kind of rhetorical um, structure of, of, of some of the discussion has been, um, you know, let's talk about Harper too. Hmm. Right. All right. We're, we're introducing this figure into a context where she hasn't been, and and, and Dickens has been the the center and the frame, um, and, and that's, you know, I, I mean that's sort of built into what we're doing here. Um, and there was talk the other day about you know demonumentalizing Dickens and Victorian literature, um, but one thing I would emphasize um, as well is, you know, I think that in in many contexts today. Um, the um, I don't I don't want to say the, the default frame, but the more obvious frame, the more obvious approach is to start with figures like Harper, um, uh, start with you know African American figures, um, and move to Victorian figures from them rather than vice versa, because um, it seems to me that in many contexts today and in many classrooms today. Um, it's a much easier sell to explain why, you know, Frederick Douglass or W.E.B. Du Bois or Francis Harper is an important figure than why Charles Dickens hmm. or George Eliot is. I mean, the, the Harper, Harper is so, and it partly is simply a question of, of nation, right? Why should we care about these English people? We have American people. Right. Um, but, but also, um, I mean, once you start, you know, reading Harper um, and, and learning about her, her, her currency, her relevance, the extent to which the things that she's interested in are things that we are interested in, um, is really obvious. It's a really easy sell. Um, and in a way, you know, I think that um, the, f the fact that she's interested in Victorian literature um, uh, works to the benefit of Victorian literature. The cultural capital has, I think, is shifting from in the 19th century um, so that, you know, I don't know, I teach, um, when I teach Bleak House with the Bond Woman's narrative, um, you know, this, this, this rewriting of it, um, a lot of my students come away um, with the view that the most important thing, the most important thing to them about Bleak House is precisely that it is a source for the hmm. Bond Woman's narrative. Um, it's this kind of incredible reorientation. Um, that's, that's oh. fascinating to me because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I want to, you know, shout out to the people like Francis Smith Foster and Carla and Melba uh, Boyd, the people who brought us the, the tools to study Harper again, uh, Mary Emma Graham, uh, you know, she was not part of uh, the, uh, we'll call it, you know, white American literary studies for, she was never forgotten in black culture. I mean, if you look at all the major, uh, like William Still or Du Bois or Brown's like encyclopedias of prominent black Americans, there's always a chapter on Harper. So she wasn't forgotten in black memory, but in white, ins predominantly white institutions, um, it's really been only recently that um, she's been seen. So it's oh, sure. good. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm glad for the flip-flop, but, um, yeah. you know, even more of a shout out to the people who made that happen, right. because I never read Harper in grad school. Yeah. 
Um, well, uh, if I could jump back in to ask Carla a question. Um, uh, uh, coming out of what you're saying, Meredith, uh, on yesterday's panel, um, you know, for most of the panelists, the answer to the question of where, where did you learn about Harper? Um, you know, the answer was, was from Carla Peterson. Um, so like Carla Peterson, where did you learn about Harper? Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I am not sure. So, um, I I actually did um, you know European literature before I started went into African American, and I mean this is kind of a personal answer. Uh, my grandmother died, and she was a hundred years old, and I was like, I need to read people who might have been born around her time or something like that, and so I started reading just wildly all around in the 19th century how i actually got to harper um i mean nobody had taught me harper right i mean this was way way back then um but i would have to so i was reading just um harper and hopkins and the spiritual um autobiographer charlotte fortin uh, Sojourner Truth, just all of them, and that's what produced Doers of the Word. Um, but Harper has such staying power, and one of the things that she lived so long, yeah. you know, she started writing in 1845 and quit at, what, 1911, and so there's just so much there, and um, I think so I read her, and why did she stay with me, and why did I teach her and force all my poor graduate students to, to learn? Is I, so A lot of this was said yesterday. Um, Iola Leroy does everything. It really does. Um, it does history, right? It does African-American history. Um, it does gender. Uh, it does, you know, and just... Um, uh, I think it was Nazara or somebody yesterday talking about class and um, and the way in which you know you shift from the so-called elite to the so-called non-elites and the way in which they're actually in a different language voicing a lot of the same sentiments. Um, it, there's just so much to, to that novel that it's endless. That was said yesterday. But where I I read her on my own, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> a moment of pause. I should say that I, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to recommend to folks uh, who are reading Iola Leroy uh, to also look at the poet poetry to make a little plug, uh, and I think that I think studying the poetry carefully can help you hear the different voices in the novel. Um, uh, one of the things I think about that sometimes trips people up reading Harper for the first time is um, she's got a kind of deceptive simplicity. There's nothing simple about her writing, but it, if you're going to read quickly, you're going to think it's simple. And, and so I would point you to a couple of the, some of the poems in um, Sketches of Southern Life, which is 1872. In particular, Victorious could, could look at the Aunt Chloe sequence as a bunch of dramatic monologues. I think, you know, your critical language would help us here. Uh, and one I'd recommend in particular is um, Learning to Read, uh, which is a poem about uh, the spectacle of illiteracy um, serving as a cover for actually being a reader so that Uncle Caldwell greases the pages of a book and sticks them in his hat so as to look illiterate so he can buy time to read, right? So if you take in the complexity of that, right, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, um, you know, reading for enslaved people was illegal and punishable. So, you know, you had, it was a self-protective device, but it was also a way to keep reading. Um, and it's a, it's a warning to people who are, go to, to white readers in, uh, uh, who are just going to look at superficial appearances. Um, you know, and you might take that uh, to the opening chapter of Iola Leroy, The Mystery of Market Speech. The very first thing you get at the threshold of this novel are enslaved, people speaking a language that doesn't mean what it seems to mean, which is to say, Harper is going to teach you at the threshold to be a more careful reader. And if you're not, um, you can't say she didn't warn you. 
right? Um, she's trying to, you know, introduce you to these complex registers of signification that are always going to be operable. And she does take care, uh, you know, in the poetry as well as the prose to think about, always to think about multiple readerships. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to recommend that. And also, um, she's also incredibly ambitious. Her uh, uh, blank verse epic, Moses, uh, shares a lot of the thematics of uh, Ayala Leroy. It, you know, her interest in Moses is in part because um, he chooses what I like to think of as solidarity with the enslaved Jews over his privileged life in the palace. That's again a story, uh, that is the story of Ayala Leroy. It's a story of choosing, having a choice and choosing solidarity, uh, which is also uh, Harper's own life story. Like, what does it mean um, to choose? She was herself never enslaved, um, but took on the responsibility of uh, solidarity with the newly emancipated uh, enslaved persons in the South, um, doing a really risky tour uh, in the 1870s. Uh, you know, scary enough to circulate in the abolitionist period and sleep for the first time in white people's houses. And, uh, you know, they're at her antebellum career is really interesting. Her postbellum career is just hugely risky um, uh, and brave. Uh, so anyway, I really recommend uh, reading the poetry in concert with um, uh, the novels, um, if I can put in my pitch. Another thing that I think is uh, uh, interesting about her is um, you talked about Moses. So her careful elaboration of black ma men who are potential leaders and who, um, I mean, you, you know, you would not find that among white abolitionist feminists of the day at all. And yet the way in which she really looks for that potential in, you know, in black male leadership. So Moses is one. And then in the, uh, in the fancy sketches, it's uh, Zumbi de Palmares, so the, the leader of a maroon community. And he, she's got a poem, right, on Zumbi as well. And I've always, and, and then the fact that the, the novel, Iola Leroy, doesn't start with Iola. You wait 50, 60 pages till you get her. But you start with Robert Anderson, who I think is one of the most fascinating characters in the novel. He doesn't emerge as a leader, but I see him as a mediating figure. Uh, he's a translator. He can move from, you know, from one community to another. And a white, um, a so-called elite black, um, you know, the, the rural folk, et cetera, et cetera, and just, you know, move and, and mediate and translate. And I think that, uh, and maybe that's what she does herself, right? That's one of, yeah. Fascinating, yeah. This conversation has been so extraordinary. I'm, I've been enjoying every bit of it. And we have a few questions. And I'm, I'm gonna start with the, the one that's kind of moved its way up, uh, been uploaded, and it's from Kathleen Fredrickson, who writes, I'm enjoying hearing about the transatlantic oh. connections you've unearthed about the moments when you've been surprised by these connections in your respective archives, I thought I'd ask about the flip side, what ideas or texts didn't circulate hmm. in the way that you were expecting? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Carla, I remember once you quizzing me on, uh, 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 on the, what I thought the poem, the poets who were most popular amongst African-American readers were. Um, and it was like Thomas Campbell and, uh, do you remember this? Uh, we had a, it was a conversation we had about when you were studying the readers, uh, and, and, uh, you know, I, I do think, uh, Americans and African Americans tended to read British poets who came to the U.S., Thomas More, um, and abolitionist figures, but not necessarily, um, not always Wordsworth or, um, you know, it's the religion, the Coleridge of AIDS to reflection and not the Coleridge of Kubla Khan, that kind of thing. I don't, do you remember that, Carla? There's an earlier part no, of your work. You were, no, you were no, studying no. the Rochester reading room records. Um, that's one place you could go as a book historian to try to figure out what circulated and what didn't. Um, so I'm, I, I don't have an answer. I could just, I, I, it's a great question. Um, so in the for the 18th century, I mean, really popular poets were Cowper, uh, James Thompson, um, Edward Edward Young, uh, Hannah Moore, 
Um, so one way I guess to say is um, those are the ones that they focused on, you know, um, and the ones who um, I'm trying to think again about the reading list that I've seen, uh, Pope does not appear. Um, uh, Shakespeare is always there. Milton is always there. Wordsworth is always there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that is a great question because um, we're always so oriented towards the discovery um, and, and the um, excitement of finding a connection that is there. So yeah. rather than the, the missed ones, I guess the the only one that really uh, comes to mind for me is when I started looking at George Eliot, um, I, um, and I really, <laughs> at that point, I, I agreed to write an article um, or an entry in a sort of companion to George Eliot on George Eliot and African American literature. And it was kind of a, um, I didn't have anything when I agreed to write it. So it was like, well, I, I hope there's something there. Um, and, um, and that's where I found the Spanish gypsy material. And there's, there's some uh, mill on the floss uh, material as well. Um, but I, I, what I was sort of expecting to find was, was Daniel Duranda um, as mm. the well-known Eliot work that's most explicitly about race. Um, it, it's about Jews, but Jews understood in racial terms. Um, and, and it's a, another um, Moses story, you know, very much so. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, you know, it, it's in fact a rewriting of the Spanish Gypsy in those terms, uh, where, where our hero embraces his identification with the stigmatized people, and especially given the African American, um, you know, the long-standing African American connection with the, the Exodus, the story of Moses, um, it seemed like an easy connection. Um, but uh, I didn't, I didn't find it yeah. at all. And um, I think one reason for that um, is, uh, in general, I think poetry is more mobile than fiction. Um, it's more um, uh, excerptable. Um, and, and so I think um, that maybe, you know, helped give the advantage to like the Spanish Gypsy in that context. Yeah. Um, although I don't, I don't want to overstate that since um, I found plenty of fiction that was um, mobile, uh, portable, uh, re, you know, appropriable. Um, but that, that, is, that is my answer then, is Daniel Deronda. Thank so you. One of the things we've been doing is focusing on British literature. And of course, African-Americans were reading European literature as well. And I have done much less work on that, but I was looking at the friendship albums held by the um, black women in Philadelphia and people mm. are quoting Goethe and Petrarch, um, those are two that I remember. So that's a whole, and again, it's poetry, right? Um, which is very much more portable, um, as Danny said. So that's another whole field to um, look into. And William Wells Brown quotes a lot of European and French authors as well. At the end of Clotel, uh, there's somebody's reading on a park bench, a mm. French book. I don't, I can't remember. Um, yeah, so that would be another, that I think very productive place to go. Yeah, and I would point people to the newspapers because um, newspapers are full of translated German ballads. Right. Um, you don't right. have to, ha to buy a heavy book of Goethe to know something about Goethe. You can read a cheap right. newspaper right. Uh, uh, right. and have reviews and excerpts right. um, scattered all the way through. So if you think, we now it's just fantastic that we have digital access to so many of these periodicals. Right. Uh, it really gives you a different sense of where literary culture resided. Yes. Thank you. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I'd love to ask another question. This is from Eric Gardner who writes, I love Professor Peterson's sense of Harper pushing sympathy toward mutuality, mm. especially in dialogue with Professor Spears's recognition of Harper's critiques of sentimentalism yesterday. I wonder if folks could talk more about how Harper inserted herself into such transatlantic dialogues, including print dialogues, which might also be a fun comparison to Dickens. Mm. 
Meredith, take that. Oh, no, I was going to say that the, the first part of the question was really about, uh, about sympathy. Uh, so. Yeah, but the second part was about yeah. the in about conversation yeah. with. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not quite sure what to say. I, I will say that, um, you know, and I've said some of this in the piece that I uh, uh, published on Harper, it's clear that her poems were designed to circulate, right? I mean, she understands that she's publishing in newspapers uh, and speaking uh, in complicated ways to audiences. And if you think about, and this is important for Dickens too, so uh, if you think of, um, we think a lot about serials coming out every month or in, you know, in um, time, temporal intervals, but uh, lecturers moved across the country and spoke again and again uh, to different audiences uh, and recirculated stuff from place to place. Uh, uh, and so if you take that understanding of um, the circulating body as well as the circulating text back uh, to Harper's early career is pretty, pretty fascinating. And you can see some of her newspaper poems are sent back to the National Anti-Slavery Standard and there's a little head note uh, you know, that they were sent in a letter to Lydia Maria Child, and there's a little head note about where Harper was when she sent in that, that poem. Uh, and the, and the, the abolitionist papers are covering the lectures. So it's very complicated um, uh, temporal patterns of circulating bodies and circulating um, texts um, that are worth uh, thinking about. And again, you could take that, if you take Harper as your model, you could take that back to Dickens and think about his tours uh, and which characters he animated in when he was uh, in his lecture tours uh, and how how he keyed his periodical writing uh, to uh, his appearances. Um, that's one, one, one way to go with that. Yeah, something that, that occurs to me is, um, I mean, I, I love this, the idea of, of um, sort of working with the concept of sympathy and, and moving it towards uh, congeniality, mutuality, um, and um, especially because Sympathy is often, um, I mean, it has a lot of different uh, aspects to it, right? But it's, it's often the, the discourse of um, kind of uh, middle class benevolence towards the poor. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a patronizing aspect to it as opposed to mutuality. Um, and, and so the reworking of it seems very important, but it also makes me wonder um, something I know nothing about. Um, which is the status, the similar question if you look at like Chartist poetry. Hmm. Um, you know, get away from Dickens, look at British working class writing and, um, and whether uh, there's any kind of, of similar um, work with and against sympathy that, that Carl is describing in, in Harper. I don't know. Um, I don't know <laughs> enough about that. But um, just, um, I'm not answering Eric's question at all. But um, uh, what I think that, so one of the things I think is that you see that model of mutuality with Harper's readers. So that, you know, embedded within the text and the poem, the, the reader is embedded within the poem. And she always has that sense of the reader and is treating that reader on those terms of mutuality. And I think that that's one aspect that is pervasive in the poems, in the short stories, in the sketches, in the, in the uh, novel, et cetera, which is remarkable, remarkable. Yeah, and to push it back to the fiction, the, um, just to amplify something that Carla said earlier, the centrality of the conversation, it's not a binary. It's not a sympathy binary with a giver and a receiver of sympathy. It's pushing towards a, a much more complicated dialogic understanding of an issue on which there's a range of opinion. Uh, and you, the reader, are invited to be in that conversation and to try to resolve it. So that's one, I think, technical narrative right. strategy right. that she uses right. to do right. exactly and that. And just the fact that in Iola Leroy, the conversazione and the friends in council, and then is it Aunt Linda? I mean, they're all separated just by a few chapters. And so they're, the work that it's, it's a, the work is accumulative. You mm -hmm. know, we're going to go and, and converse again and yet again <laughs> and yet again. And the conversation is ongoing and endless. Yeah. And, and I, I think this conversation could also be <laughs> endless. That's the same thing. Um, we have time for just one more question. So I'm going to ask 
um, one that Kaylin Madden posed. She writes a follow-up uh, to a couple of the other questions asked. I wonder if any of the panelists have thoughts about connections between Iola Leroy or Harper's work in general and the writers writing from the late 19th century in Britain. Mm -hmm. Have any connections with the 1890s British or global suffragist or feminist writing emerged? There seems to be so many rich connections between uh, 18th through 19th century British authors and Harper, but I'm wondering about texts contemporary with Iola Leroy. It's a great question. Of course, feminism, if you want to talk about things that are inherently transatlantic, like print culture, feminism, 19th century feminism is another one. Uh, all these feminists were reading each other, found, had great solidarity with each other. Um, it's a, that's a, just a terrific question. I don't know enough about, about know. that period in England, but boy, that sounds like a really good trail to uh, pursue. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, the um, uh, you know, when I think of, of African American writers really engaged with uh, like British literature of the fin de siècle, I think of Du Bois, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, but and I think it matters there that, that he's a lot younger <laughs> um, than than Harper. Uh, um, you know, so I think of her literary frame of reference anyway as, as mostly formed earlier. Um, although, I mean, she's obviously like Iola Leroy is, is directly in dialogue with William Dean's Howell, William Dean Howells, um, <clears throat> with uh, his imperative duty. So right. I, I would um, note that. Um, but yeah, but, but directly in terms of uh, sort of global suffragist or feminist thought uh, and writing, I don't know either. So I'm trying to remember so is th that the period of the new woman and the new woman novel? So that might be um, a place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and off the top of my head, I just don't see that um, Harper uh, would be on the same platform as, you know, with the concept of the new woman and so forth. So I don't... Um, yeah, I don't see it, but that, that w when I think of that period, and again, I know very little about it, but what I remember is the production of all these, the new woman novel, right, writing. Jason, you might know. <laughs> no, I think you're right, and I, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to venture into speculation. I, I yeah, the same way that you're voicing some some hesitation there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Thank you so much, all of you. I'm gonna turn things over to Renee so she can close out this session, but I think you've opened up so many important questions. And the good news is that we, we have um, the next year, all of us. <laughs> Carly, you said so much about the communities that Harper was imagining and the Black writers were imagining. And, and I would like to think that that, that we have through this week formed a kind of community that can, can continue thinking together. Um, and hopefully we'll get to uh, meet many of us next summer in Santa Cruz to continue thinking about Harper and, uh, and also Charles Dickens. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you all, that was just, that was fabulous. And, and um, just, Thinking about thinking about the community and the way that that you and the panelists in um, in previous days have really done the work of, as you say, shifting the paradigms of how we read and shifting the paradigms of of the universe. Um, it's exhilarating, and and I'm so looking forward to to having the rest of the year and next year to to keep shifting those paradigms and to keep expanding the way we're thinking. And and so I just I can't thank you enough for that wonderful, wonderful session. Um, just a few things to remind everybody about. Um, one is that we are, we are so happy that this week's virtual events could be free and open to anybody who, um, who wanted to join in and be part of the conversation. But that one of the ways that we can continue having programming like this um, is through the generous donations of people who have the ability to give. So, um, so Tara Thomas is going to post a link to our Dickens donations page in the chat um, for anybody who who uh, has the capacity to donate. We appreciate so much um, 
whatever people can do to help us out. And I also wanted to remind everybody of three more events this week. Um, we are not done yet. The first is that tonight we are having a grand party to which everybody is invited, all capital letters. Usually we do this on Thursday night of the universe and there are copious quantities of cake and cheese and wine and wonderful conversation. Um, so we are gonna recreate that as best we can over, um, over Zoom tonight. The link is available on the, Dickens, on the virtual Dickens Universe webpage. Um, for those of you who've spent the last few days making Mumbai pie, we expect you to bring your productions and show us all and for everyone else, just you know, bring a glass of wine and, and, um, and your conversation and we're excited to see you there. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, there is a screening of, um, of the Neighborhood Academic Initiatives production um, that they put on um, about David Copperfield in, in Los Angeles. Um, and there's gonna be a Q&A period with the students who are part of that and also with Jacqueline Barrios, um, the, um, the teacher at, um, at Fauché and the, the, um, the person who many of you have already seen this week in, um, in the initial conversation between Jacqueline and Jason and Trisha and Bridget on Sunday. Um, Jacqueline is a graduate student at UCLA as well as a veteran high school teacher um, at Fauché um, and part of the Neighborhood Academic Initiative. And so we're really excited to be able to see this production. Usually you have to go down to LA to see it and to be able to talk to Jacqueline and her students about it. So that is tomorrow at, um, at 10 a.m. The registration for that, if you haven't registered yet, is also available on the Virtual Dickens Universe webpage. And then the final event that we are having this week is a, a fundraising mini auction on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Um, several of the Friends of the Dickens Universe have gathered together some lovely items that they're going to be auctioning off, and we are eager to have people participate in that. Um, Tara has posted the link to that also in the chat. So again, that is happening Saturday at 10 a.m. So um, again, a huge thank you to our panelists, a huge thank you to our organizers, we look forward to seeing you tonight at the grand party and tomorrow at the screening and hopefully Saturday at the auction. So thank you, thank you all so much and, um, and enjoy the rest of your day.